guys, it's Michelle Taylor Willis, and thanks again for tuning in to According. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor. Hey, it's Michelle Taylor Willis. Back at you. You're watching According to Michelle. Welcome to the According to Michelle show. It's Michelle Taylor Willis, the queen and the princess of soap food. You guys pick whichever one is more age appropriate. I'm sure everybody would say. Princess, of course, because I'm the princess of Sofu. You're listening to According to Michelle on Mix Double X 106 Radio.com. That's two X's, M I X X 106 Radio.com. And I'm just going to go ahead and put it out here. Yes, I am lisping just a bit. And I'm keeping my retainers in. I have to because I lost them for three days and I had to go and get re replacements. So I have to make up for all the times that my teeth might have spread over the last three days. Okay, now we can talk about UDC not being here last week. Yeah. So, speaking of going to the doctor. Yeah. Uh, That's something more men need to do. You shouldn't allow it to get to a point where you're sick to go to the doctor. You got to do regular checkups. And leave people, like, wondering and waiting and yeah. hoping that you're not laid out in a ditch somewhere. Yeah, because it's not fun when you're, like, sick and can't help yourself. It's not. It's yeah. also not fun when you're wondering where your friends are in right. racist America. Black man not showing up somewhere isn't a thing. I don't know what that means, but I just know <laughs> that it's not fun when you're sick. When you're not sick, when you're sick and you, you, you can't, you know, do anything. It, it, it wipes you out. I tell anybody now, go get checked out before it gets too bad. I was really hoping you'd be here last week so we could talk about this whole, you know, Georgia Atlanta thing, Kemp. Bottoms thing. What do you think about that? Uh, I don't have an opinion. I just think that. Um, city, Did you just say you don't have an opinion? I, you know, I, I just mean, this somebody's in his ear. I'm just telling you. No, you my, thing is, is, my thing is, my thing is, Keisha is the CEO and the face of the city of Atlanta. And she has to listen to the people and the citizens that elected her, and they tell her what they need, and businesses can dictate how you come into their business. So if business say no mask, no service, then the governor can say whatever he wants to say. But businesses will dictate how we go forward in the state of Georgia. So every business that says you can't come in here without a mask, he can say whatever he wants to say. He can grandstand, make the taxpayer spend money to go to court. And it matters not because you cannot force me to serve somebody in a pandemic without a mask on. That's right. Yeah. Please. I just want to jump in. Um, the concern with that this fight, the concern with this fight is that Atlanta is not the only one right. that has mandated right. mask. And so why was she separated from everybody and attacked and sued? Um, that's a concern, especially since we just went through a huge budget cut. So who was actually paying for this lawsuit? It's always the taxpayers. You know? Exactly. And yeah, so, we pay for everything. And it's all, it's all, you know, smoke and mirrors, you know. Let me sue Atlanta because it's the biggest city in the state. And let me go after Keisha Lance Bottoms because she's the biggest uh, target on the Democratic side in the state of Georgia. And so, you know, he's playing politics and he's paying it, you know, at your expense. I mean, is there another a better person that could have the stage all on her own? I mean, she's making her own rounds. She's her making own her news. own rounds all the way from New York. And I'm talking about, mm -hmm. yes, she's a state rep. And I have a feeling her political journey is not going to stop here. But you talk about a true advocate for the people, a true advocate for children, a true advocate for parents, a true advocate for you, really. You talk about servant leadership and actually, you know, taking um, what she's learned and her experiences and using them to do everything she can to, for, to further, to further the benefit of all Georgia citizens. I mean, State Representative Deborah Bazin. Thank you. But I'm so glad that you actually didn't make it on the show. You know, it makes me think, gosh, I wish I'd spent more time mm -hmm. with John Lewis. Right. Right? And all these times we were saying, you know, I got to bring him on the show. And I said, listen, when you come in, next time you're not, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, we're going to bring you in the show. When session's over, you got to come on the show. And, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking about all the times I missed just sitting at his feet, mm -hmm. listening to stories. Mm -hmm. 
I so agree with you because even family members of mine have passed on, my grandmother, my mom. But um, even with John Lewis, I, we would, my mom, um, she had uh, migrated to Virginia and I used to see him in the um, airport. We used to meet there and have a good conversation. He was so sweet, down to earth. He really was. And took time. He didn't have to stop, but we just had conversations there and wished each other well. And I remember the last time I saw him was here, actually. I in the Mix 106 studio? He was here, I didn't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> At the airport, Hartfield Jackson Airport. Let me, let me be clear. Let me I take everything very literally, <laughs> Representative. So I was leaving, um, I was going to catch a plane and he was leaving and we stopped and embraced and had a conversation. Uh, so I'm at conferences. Um, I knew something was wrong. I grabbed his hands and I just prayed with him mm -hmm. because I could tell he was moving slower. Right. You could um, see it kind right. of taking its toll. Yeah. But I would, but he kept showing up. Right. And that's the thing. Some of us, we just stop when we get news about our health or something. And we're like, no, okay, this is this. And I, I just can't go anymore. No, the greats, they keep going because they understand that people depend on them. Right. And that this is their calling. This That's is right. their assignment. Yeah, I think you're right. The challenge is, you know, are they going to continue and really, because that's a heavy burden mm -hmm. to bear. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think intentionality is the key. So if Andy Young... And um, John Lewis and, you know, all of these greats came together and said, you're yeah. it. Mm -hmm. You're it. Mm -hmm. You're the next one. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you guys are coming together and saying, hey, it's you. We're going to get behind you. That's We're going right. to push you forward. That's right. Sometimes that's all people need. Is that going to be enough? Yes, I agree. And I think it's necessary. People may frown upon that um, type of decision. But it's necessary because a lot of times I believe people see things in you that you may not see in That's yourself. Right. And That's so right. once you have several people telling you the same thing and pushing you forward and encouraging you, then it becomes real. And you know that you have, again, an assignment and you have to step into that role. And I think that that's... Um it's bitter. It's a bittersweet moment for mm -hmm. people, right? Because you mm -hmm. know that's where that's when the haters really show up. Oh yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, if they weren't out there when you were just kind of doing your mm -hmm. thing, once you step out and everybody else steps out and says, mm -hmm. you know, you say I'm it, they say you're it. That's kind of like when the, you know, yes, the the waters part and everything turns crazy. But I mean, legislatively, like from a political standpoint. Um, do you feel like right now in this time, the risk is greater just because there's so much turmoil and so much? I mean, I don't really know what's different now from back in the 60s or even before that from a, you know, I mean, it's just it looks different. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the strife feels, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, nobody's getting hosed in right. the streets, but right. the strife feels the same, especially when you had covid and mm -hmm. killer bees. Did you know we had killer bees? I heard. So we much. found that out last last week that there were actually there's a killer bee pandemic too. Yeah, I know. But we can only you, deal with one, so bees go somewhere. <laughs> bees go somewhere else. I know. And apparently they melt you when they get you. So I don't know. Oh, I don't know how true Jesus. that is, but 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 it feel, the strife feels. Mm -hmm. So is the risk greater now than it was? I don't think the risk is greater. I think we have to be smarter about the method that we use to deal with it. Um, a lot of times we want to do press conferences or we want to write a letter or do certain things. And those are appropriate also along with a plan, mm -hmm. but we have to be more strategic. And I believe that that's the way that John Lewis and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and C.T. Vivian dealt with things. Right. It wasn't just like, okay, I'm upset. I need to do something and I'm going to run and do so. No, you have to be strategic. You have to stop, think about it, and think about the consequences or think about the outcome. What do you really want to see come out of this? Right. What right. do you expect to come out of Reverse this? engineer it, right? 
Definitely. Yeah. So. And I think too, um, <clears throat> to this vision and this collective effort, there's mm-hmm. a there's a there's a a time when you say, okay, here is what we want. But I think mm-hmm. too, the the challenge is getting to that thing because we can't fix everything. Right. Right. And we can't have fifteen go do's mm-hmm. and 15 action mm-hmm. items, mm-hmm. but getting people on the same accord and one vision to say, this is what we want and this is how we're going to get it done. That's I mean, right. I think that that's, but that's a challenge, right? To, to get that vision. Well, I think to your point, it might be a little off subject, but I had never been so proud to be in the democratic caucus this session When we all came together as one on a single issue that we had to vote on, because everybody has different districts and there's different reasons. However, when we sat there and we all voted together, I had never been so proud. And we sent a message. And that's what I'm talking about, being strategic. Right. There was a message sent to those on the other side of the aisle. They were like... They are together, right. united, and it was strategic. Right, because they expect surprised. there to be dissension. Exactly, right? exactly. So we, we've done that several times. And with the budget, um, <laughs> we came out. There, there were several different individuals that have been there for years that have never voted against the budget. And when that board lit up red and they <laughs> saw those individuals that had never voted against, that voted against. There was murmuring. There was they were walking. There were so many different movements, right? Because this was never done. They're not before. expecting real unity. Never expected that. Right. So we are strategic now, and we are being more united about what we do. So there's hope. The definitely hope. So we can get that vision. Definitely hope. And all we have to do now is flip the house and flip the senate, so that we can truly represent our constituents. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to truly represent my customers because I got to play some ads <laughs> and I got to pay some bills around here. But um, I want to come back and learn a little bit about you because you're from New York. And I don't know if I you am. know, but I can still hear the accent when you say Just certain things. Bit. I'm like, oh, oh, she's got New York in her, which means she'll cut you if you if she needs to. <laughs> Guys, you're listening to the According to Michelle on MixXX106 Radio.com or watching us on AIB Network. Hang tight. We will be right back. It's time for new leadership in the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, and Patrick Labatt is the right leader for the right office at the right time. I've created a repeat offender initiative that actually takes into account partnerships with the judges, with the DA, and and certainly the Sheriff's Office taking the lead on really creating this ROI, if if you will, so that we can focus on tracking down repeat offenders who commit over 40% of the crime. Patrick Labatt is a proven leader who will deliver the right vision for the Fulton County Sheriff's Office. He proudly served as president of the Georgia Jail Association from 2016 to 2017. He was voted as the Georgia Jail Association Jail Administrator of the Year in 2015 and 2019. It's time for new leadership in the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, and Patrick Labatt is the right leader for the right office at the right time. I'm Patrick Labatt, and I approve this message. Coming up next, Danny Manning. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor Willis, and thanks again for tuning in to According. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor. Hey, it's Michelle Taylor Willis. Back at you. You're watching According to Michelle. You're back on According to Michelle with uh, DC, who's in the house today, who wasn't in the house yesterday, but he's back in the house today. MixXX106Radio.com is the According to Michelle show on the new AIB network, and we are here with the one. The only, the beautiful, the dashiki mask, the mom, the wife, the daughter, the amazing, the, wait, what's another word? The leader, the visionary, the state representative, Deborah Baysmore. How was that? So, all right, so when we left here, we were talking just a little bit about our new leaders, right? And mm-hmm. our new our new voices, our new voice and all that good stuff. Um, but you've been a voice and you could, you are a voice for a lot of people that don't even really know you're a voice for them. But um, you're from New York I am. and people from New York have voices. 
Good or bad, right? I, mean, I agree. Good or bad. So yes. you're from Brooklyn? My family's from Brooklyn and then migrated it, migrated up north a little ways, about an hour and a half out of the boroughs. How how old were you when that happened? I was not born at that time. Okay. So I did grow up. So Liberty is you know. Yes. Got you. A little town. But um, I know New Yorkers are hard with other New Yorkers when you say you don't live in the Bronx. Right, yeah, it's like you, it doesn't you're count. You're not from New York. It's like it doesn't count. Our but, intern, is he's okay. like, yeah. But New this York. is what I say. I didn't have to live in the boroughs because the borough lived in my house. My mother was straight up and down Brooklyn, New York. Like, what does that mean? What does she do? <laughs> I can't, I can't tell people that. <laughs> uh -oh. oh, yeah, no, please she, tell. Cut the cameras. This is okay. where we cut the cameras. We no, get the real Deborah Bays on now. She was really New York. She just taught us how to live, protect ourselves, and how to be. Um, but dignified. Right. Very I dignified. I could see that. Yes. So what do, what do you think? Because she's passed away now, she right? She has, yes. So what is the single most impressionable thing that you have left of your mom? My mom was a leader also, where we lived. Um, she fought for individuals. Um, she fought for housing. Um, what was she? What was her job? What did she do? So that wasn't her job. That was her side job. <laughs> <laughs> Community activist, right. right? So she was a buyer for one of the big stores there. Oh, okay. And and that's what she did. She went between two different stores, which was like half an hour away from one another. And so mm -hmm. she did that. Um, my dad died when I was 18 months old. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I never knew him, but she had remarried. And so I had a stepdad. And unfortunately, both of them had passed away within a few months of each other. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They say people, though, who are like really yeah. attached and deep in love, like once one goes, like they want to go yeah. be with the other one. Yeah. He passed away in April. 2013, and she passed away in August 2013. Wow. So yeah. they are definitely still together. Yeah. And so when he, I mean, so that's the dad that you knew, yes. right? Yes, yes. So what was it like, do you think, for your mom being, you know, having a baby and, you know, in a new place and just trying to, I mean, do you think that that contributed to some of her strength? Because she sounds like she was very strong. I think with my grandmother also, because my grandmother lived with us for a, a short period of time, too. Well, not that short, but she lived with us also. And she's from South Carolina. Gotcha. So I had a mix. I had part of the South. Yeah, that Southern charm. Okay, and I had Brooklyn, New York. So I had both of them. So, so that makes sense. I can see both of those mm -hmm. in you, right? I can see this very dignified. You see, I mean, she's, even when she was dancing, when we opened up the sequence, she was dancing, she was like, <laughs> like with perfect posture <laughs> you know people start dancing you know they kind of lose it she's like no, I'm yeah she said I'm getting it <laughs> really getting it oh I'm, I'm feeling it now <laughs> but um, but you can see too even especially as you're out here in these streets as people mm -hmm. say that you you stand up you have a very strong voice, and um, and you're not allowed to, to make it be heard so I can see both sides both women in you that's a good thing. It is a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. So you said your mom was out, you know, she fought for for, for housing yes. and for Yes, for for low income housing, for we we grew up um around a lot of it I don't know if I should go there. You can say it. If, we, so, if it's not good, we'll take it out. Okay. But <laughs> it, it wasn't bad. We just grew up with a lot of Jewish people okay. that owned a lot of things. And so when you grow up with a certain ethnicity, they're not um, sensitive to what other people need. Right. And so she stood up and she was always in the school. She stood up for the housing, like I said, and she was uh, a person in the community that people looked up to. My grandmother, and I said this in the well, this session, she had, I'd never forget the picture. She was carrying her protest sign because and this is New York now I don't know if you remember Woolworths oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. so when I was little we had a Woolworths and they used to serve at the counter hot dogs and hamburgers and things like that but mm. well, we couldn't sit at the counter mm. and so she was out protesting you remember your grandmother my grandmother how and old it, were you when do you remember how oh, old you I can't been? remember how old I was but I remember that once I got into the sixth grade 
because the school was not far from where the Woolworths was. They allowed us at lunchtime to leave and go get something to eat. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I remember we were able to sit at the counter when I was in sixth grade. It's okay to so you can be angry and sin not. So absolutely, there you go. absolutely. <coughs> so being talking about being in the gold dome, right, mm -hmm. and legislation. How long have you been? Um, four years. It's been four, God, it's been four years. Four years. And chief of staff prior to that. Right. So that was something interesting too. Yeah, mm -hmm. chief of, chief of staff for Senator Donzella James, who mm -hmm. has, I mean. She was in about a year and a half ago when I first started doing this show. Mm -hmm. And she talked about all the places that she's been, <clears throat> you know, people that she's met. I mean, she has, she's fantastic. So for you to be able to sit at her feet, right? Mm -hmm. We started, we talked a little bit earlier about really being able to glean right. history and information from those who have been there before. Mm -hmm. That I mean, is that when you knew you were going to branch out and kind of do your own thing? Or was it before that? So, no, um... I was working with her. I knew it wasn't my assignment at that time. And people kept saying to me, you're going to be a legislator. You're going to be a legislator. I said, no, thank you. I'm fine where I am. Mm -hmm. And then I felt and I knew in my spirit when it was time. And that's when I decided to go ahead and run. And so I ran and here I am. Yeah. And you ran fine. You yes. ran a fine race. But I think it's interesting you said because... Again, the greats, right? People who mm -hmm. are influencers and change makers, they know mm -hmm. when the shift mm -hmm. is kind of happening, right? And it happens, I think, several times over yes. your life where you know, okay, now here's an opportunity for me to be great again, right? <laughs> or here's an opportunity for me. She's like, well, I don't know if I call it great. <laughs> <great. laughs> yeah, I know, right? I'm like slowly planting seeds. Uh, see, I just did it again, Senator. Right. See how I keep... She got to get used to it. I wonder why she keeps saying I don't know. It just comes... Yeah, get used to it. The retainers and the S's just want to have their there way with my retainers. But, um, but yeah, I'm planting these seeds. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that there's something to that, right? When you really kind of yes. start to know... Okay, it's time to do this. Uh -huh. It's time to do something different. Mm -hmm. Even if it feels weird. I think if it feels weird, that's when the, the, the risk is greatest, but the reward right. is even greater. Right. And I've always said, even when I, my first term, I said, I don't plan to come down here to die in the seat. Mm -hmm. I had a plan. And when I know that it's time for me to leave that particular seat, I will reach back and find someone and help groom them. Right. Because I think it's necessary that we just not elect people that are off the street. And they may have good intentions, right. but they have no experience. Right. It takes you at least two years right. to build to build up relationships with people. And that is so important to get to know the processes. Right. So it takes a while. So if you have already pulled somebody out of that public and, you know, lay person position and help them, pull them forward. Then when you get ready to leave, you know you've left that seat in good hands and you know that your constituents are going to be taken care of. Right. So that was my goal. Yeah, and I think we've seen that happen, in, in, especially in a lot of local mm -hmm. races where— um, it's almost like people just wake up and say, all right, I'm running. Exactly. And they have no uh, mm -hmm. no knowledge of the law, mm -hmm. no knowledge of the processes, right. no knowledge of anything. Right. And they just run and, and they win. Win. <laughs> right. And then they're in a position where they have no idea how to navigate. Correct. And that's why I think, I think, don't get me wrong, I think the local races mm -hmm. are the most important mm -hmm. in terms of Definitely. really inspiring change, right? Mm -hmm. Um but I think we got to be strategic yes. about how we take these posts yes. and who we put in those posts because in the wrong hands, as we can see, yes. you get the wrong person in and it's disaster. It is. And and when the first time I ran and I told people, I, I would tell them who I am and give them what I've done. But then I would always say, don't take my word for it. Mm. Google me. Mm. Right. Go out and see if what I'm telling you is factual. And then I said, 
Not only Google me, Google all of us. Right. All the candidates running. So some people didn't want to be Googled and some didn't have a problem being Googled. I, I don't have a problem because what I'm telling you is factual. So I, I encourage people, get to know who you are putting in a position because they may be there for two years, four years, 25 years. You need to know these people. Right. You need to know what they're doing. Because we all could have this persona on the outside. Mm -hmm. But if you don't understand what they're really about and what they're doing, if they're working for you, then you lose. So the lieutenant governor decided, I want to make some changes. Well, when you make changes to something, a bill, it slows down the process. Mm -hmm. We only had 11 days left. Right. So the process is slowed yeah, down. COVID messed up. I mean, it, even everything. just the yeah, session and everything. So he wanted to change. But the language that he wanted to put in the bill would have killed the bill. Mm. And they knew politically it would have been suicide for them right. if they had not passed that bill. Right. So they took that language out and they put it in another bill. HB 838, protecting police officers. Right. And they say it's protecting police officers. However, it really doesn't, only because there's already law on the books that if you kill a police officer or do anything to a police, you get more time with the law that's on the books than what they put in there. Right. Because I believe it went up to five years in jail. When you kill a police officer, I think you get like life or something. That's <laughs> already on. Mm -hmm. And our... Um, minority leader, he got up and quoted it, but they still passed it. Yeah. And also that 838 also said, and this is really, this was really directed at protesters getting up in police officers face because right. they're frustrated and whatever, not touching them. So it's really subjective because if they feel like they're being threatened right. or they whatever. They can decide what that space exactly. looks like. Right? They can charge yeah. you. Yeah. Not only can they charge you, they can now sue you. That's what that piece of legislation did. And it passed. Because we are in the minority mm -hmm. and we don't have the votes. Wow. Okay, I'm going to hold you right there because I'm going to come back through that. Because sure. I think these are the pieces that people don't understand, uh -huh. right? That what actually happens. Uh -huh. It sounds great to be able to draft right. draft some legislation. and then, But to get it past mm -hmm. is a whole nother thing. Guys, yes, you're listening to the According to Michelle show on Mix, double X, one Oh six radio.com. I'm going to pass my own legislation in the <laughs> form of five abs. Hang tight. We'll be right back. When it comes to the best biosecurity and biosafety protocols to help your business thrive during these challenging times of face masks, viruses, and gloves, schools, businesses, sports arenas, hotels, and even churches are turning to America's top COVID-19 experts. Providing is a solution that has the ability to change the way we fight COVID-19. Hi, I'm Socrates Garrett, Chief Operating Officer for SRS Inc. The single source solution for biosecurity protocols, SRS, will ensure that your business does not shut down. What separates SRS from other companies? We understand that if you control your environment, you control the spread of COVID-19. SRS, the one source solution. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor Willis, and thanks again for tuning in to According. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor. Hey, it's Michelle Taylor Willis. Back at you. And you're watching According to Michelle. Welcome back, everybody. I'm just not going to separate everybody out because we are united. So there's no need for me to be like Sofu, who's the best, and Atlanta, <laughs> who's the second best, Georgia, who is, yeah, somewhere on the list. I'm joking. Guys, you're listening to the According to Michelle show on MixedXX106Radio.com, or maybe you're lucky enough to be watching us on the AIB network. We are here with, I mean, I don't know if I have any more adjectives left for you. But right now, she's state representative, Deborah Baysmore. She is an advocate, especially, I love that you're an advocate for children, yes. right? And for parents helping to raise great children. But you are an advocate for citizens, for constituents, for residents, for a greater 
better Georgia. So welcome back. Listen, let me, I want to dive back into something you said actually mm-hmm. on one of the breaks because uh, I had a, a millennial on a few weeks back mm-hmm. and he was really talking about um, how millennials or young people were not taking COVID seriously mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. And he said he felt like the only thing that was going to change is if they started getting really sick and if they started dying from mm-hmm. it. I mean, and he was, he said, it's unfortunate, but that's the only thing that's going to mm-hmm. make them see it differently. Yeah. But you, uh, you've been tracking these numbers in yes. the 18 to 29 age group. What are, what are those numbers looking like? So for months, um, I'm a member of the COVID-19 response team, which is a subcommittee of the caucus, Democratic caucus. And the one thing that I was laser focused on were the kids. When I heard that New York was experiencing children being affected and nobody was talking about it. And I was, I was really offended because I'm like, I know the numbers are out there. So why aren't you talking about it? Why aren't you ringing the bell telling right. these parents that kids can actually get COVID-19? Mm-hmm. And it's because when it was first said, oh no, the younger people won't get it. That is not true. When I looked at the numbers on the 20th, 18 to 29, that was the age group. The numbers stood then at 35,563 cases. In that one day. In that day. And then the next day, which was yesterday, 7-21, the numbers were 36,450. 59 cases. Wow. And there were 1,003 cases of COVID in that group in the hospital. All right, I'm dropping the ball. I'm dropping the ball. Do you love how I'm doing these sound effects? That means no more. Yeah. I mean, so what What should happen to get their attention? Because there's a death tide to this, too. What do the deaths Definitely. look like? I don't have that written here. But yes, they are dying. And I, I can tell you about the story that I did here. We were talking about that um, they're having these um, parties, COVID parties at colleges and different places. And they invite someone that is, has been infected. And then they want to see whoever gets infected first. Then they will get that pot of money. So one individual went to the party. He was 30 years old. He got sick wound up in the hospital on the ventilator. He told the nurse, nurses before he passed away that he did not believe this was real. And he is now gone. Wow, he was 30. Did he have 30. any uh, comorbidities? They did not state that he had anything wow. prior. So, and there's so many variables to this virus. Right. You right. don't know how it acts in this age group and that age group. We have less than a year old group that it's up to 561 cases right now. Wow. Less than a year old. And we just had a child die. So this thing is real and it 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 is affecting everybody. It's not just one group or another group. Right. And the problem is, is that younger people, a lot of times they can be carriers. And because you might not be asymptomatic or you are asymptomatic, you can take it home right. and affect other people. Right. Especially They'll be your fine, especially if you're young, quote unquote, healthy, you're good, you don't have it. Exactly. But you give it to grandma who exactly. is, you know, who has di- diabetes and COPD. Right. And yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy how this thing can move. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing too. We don't, it's so new. Right. Um, and it's it 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 changes and we mm-hmm. don't know how it affects to your point different people. And so the, the easiest thing is just to kind of stay out of its way. That's right. Right. It was nice. I enjoyed myself just having a conversation with friends. You know what? Conversation with friends. I think that'll be the next. That might be the next title of my new show. <laughs> and now I'm speaking. Not, oh my gosh, you see this? In three years, it'll be a conversation. So let me friends. write this down. I, write I'm going to see how much my check is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on that note, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody where we can find you and how we can support your campaign. <laughs> okay. Well, right now, you can go to my Facebook page. It's Deborah Jones hyphen Baysmore. Try to get fancy after I got a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> But just go on by Deborah Baysmore now. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm on Twitter at Representative, Rep, 
Deborah Baysmore 63. Um, I'm on Instagram. So the same handle. Um, right now, I have to actually transition from House to Senate information. So that has not been done out of respect for the current um, senator. So I was just waiting for her to get her affairs in order um, to be respectful. And I, I mean, I, that speaks a lot to your character, you know, but you. you're a dignified New Yorker. So mm -hmm. would we really, you know, see you or have you do anything differently? Right. Thank you. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Good luck in the race. Thank you. It's pretty much a done deal. And you're welcome. Yeah. Deborah Baysmore, advocate, leader, visionary, great. You are one of the greats. You will go down here as one of the greats because you're doing all kinds of amazing things now. Thank you so much for coming onto the According to Michelle show. And for all of you guys who are listening and watching me live and watching us on AIB Network, thank you so much. You know, we, we fill this studio with people who are examples, walking examples of people who have found out what their passion is, what yes. their purpose is, why they were put on this earth. And they have found ways to monetize it and to use it to make everybody else better. That's mm -hmm. significant. Mm -hmm. Anybody can be successful and, and do well. But really, when you are empowering other people right. to empower other people, now we've reached a realm of significance. And only the greats are the mm -hmm. ones that can do that. I promise if you can figure out what your purpose is, you can apply a little bit of action action to it. Surround yourself with people who are smarter and better than you than ways in ways that you are not. I promise the world will be your oyster again. Yes. As always, it's Michelle Taylor Willis on According to Michelle, Mix Double X, that's two X's, 106radio.com. And of course, always at 5 p.m. on Wednesdays on the AIB Network. We are out. So I was able to sit down with Danny Manning, who some of you may remember was a superstar here with the Atlanta Hawks. And you'll probably remember that he was a head coach at Wake Forest. Well, he made a little appearance here in Atlanta, and uh, I was able to sit down with him. Let's see what he had to say. Hey guys, it's Michelle Taylor Willis, and I'm super excited to one, be sitting in one of my favorite places in Midtown, or maybe I should say favorite place, right? Is that better? The Anguished Barber, which as you can see, is a barber shop. And what you can't see is on the other side of these doors is a beautiful bar. So you can actually come and get your hair cut and you can also have a great drink while you're doing it. But let me tell you what even takes us to the next level. I am sitting here with the distinguished, the illustrious, the I don't know, what other word should I use? The famous, the legendary, the basketball aficionado player, man of the year, blah, 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 Danny Manning. <laughs> was that enough? Was that quite an introduction? That was quite an introduction. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> no problem at all. So um, this didn't happen by accident. We were literally able to catch up with Danny. He's traveling through Atlanta. And of course, we know this is your old stomping ground, right? Yes, it is. I've spent some time here. You Good spent time. Just, just a little bit of time. Yes. Okay, so I'm not from Atlanta. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. So when someone says Danny Manning to me, I'm like, okay, well, I'll talk to Danny Manning. Until I start researching and asking around about you, and people are like, you're going to be talking to Danny Manning? You know Danny Manning? I'm like, well, you know. He's just kind of an old friend. He's just coming through and wanted to say, hey. But you literally, I mean, you know you're a legend. You know you are held in very high standard here in Atlanta. My time was good. You know, I got a chance to, to be a part of a great organization with the Hawks. I got yeah. a chance, more importantly, to play for a legendary coach in Lenny Wilkins, a Hall of yeah. Fame guy. And so my time was short, but I learned a lot from them, and I enjoyed my teammates, and I really enjoyed the city. Yeah, and it's changed a lot. Right? Since you were here. It sure has. How long has it been since you were in Atlanta? Well, I've been in here, or living here, it's, it's been a long time. It's been a good 20 years. But I mean visited. When's the last time you visited? Oh, I'm, I'm here every year for a couple of times. Got you. Okay. Yes. So, but you've seen the changes from when you good. played here and lived here. And then. Yes. So you said you learned a lot from your coach. What was the biggest thing or the most important thing that you learned? Lenny Wilkins is a easygoing a real spook dude, and, and the way that he coached me, I really appreciate it because that was the mentality he had. The way he related to me, the way he related to all of the guys on the team was, 
kind of a, a grandfatherly light type of vibe where I'm going to be stern, I'm going to be tough, but yeah. I'm going to show you some love and give you some compassion as well. So love and compassion is a, is a big thing, right? Because you don't always get that, you know, that coach player relationship. You don't necessarily know what you're going to get going into those situations. So, so to kind of have that um, nurturing but stern effect, it's kind of like a parent, right? Absolutely. It was just like a parent. Just you like know? a parent. And, and you could tell, you, kind of, you knew when you were not doing what you're supposed to do by the look on his face or yeah. by the tone of his voice or by the look of his eyes. But you knew it was coming from a great place because he wanted you to be the best that you could possibly do. Right. And speaking of the best, I mean, you know, some people would say that at least at the collegiate level, you were one of the best to ever play the game. I mean, I think you still hold the record for most points, right? Forward. Um, I'm very, I was very fortunate. You know, <laughs> basket, basketball is a team game. I have yeah. great teammates. I had a Hall of Fame coach in Larry Brown. And for me, I was just very blessed. And so we were fortunate enough to win a national championship yeah. in 1988. And I look at that team and we just fit. It was a good mix of guys. We all wanted the same thing. We all sacrificed for one another and we all wanted the same thing. And that's the biggest thing is being successful. Yeah. And we knew if we were all successful, everyone was going to be able to shine. Everybody was going to be able to benefit from that situation. Mm -hmm. And that was the case for us. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because um, vision and playing as a team and united. I mean, these are all the kind of things, if you look at where we are right now as the United States, these are the things we need, right? We need unity, we need vision, we need leadership, and we need collaborative play. Um, and it sounds like you're a team player, but you were groomed to be a team player, right? I mean, you went to University of Kansas. I did. Did you have that kind of mentality coming in as a college player, or were, did you learn that playing in college? Well, for me, I was very fortunate. I grew up in pro sports. My father played pro basketball. He played in the ABA and he played in the NBA. And he was someone that we would call a journeyman. He was a glue guy. He did all the little things to make the team work, right. to make the team successful. So I grew an appreciation for that very early on in my basketball years. And it was something that just stuck with me. That's how he taught me how to play the game. Right. Do something to make it easier for your teammates. That is one of the hardest messages you have to get your young people to understand when you're mentoring them and you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. You have to create options. Give yourself options. Be able to navigate. And for me, my story goes, I played four years at Kansas. I make it to the NBA. My rookie year, I blow my knee out. At that time, it's considered career threatening. Right. I'm fortunate and blessed enough. I have great doctors and great support staff around me. I come back from that injury and I do it two more times. But I revert back to, I'm not able to play. How do I navigate life? Right. And I was able to lean on the four years at Kansas that I went through, the, the education piece, the, the developing of networking, and, and, and all those things helped prepare me for that situation. And it was still tough. Right. So what was the toughest part about that? Because, again, you, you go your whole life thinking, this is it. And although I do have insurance, but this is it. And then, boom, done. And then for it to happen two more times, like, what did that feel like? What were you thinking? The first time was the hardest because yeah. it was unknown. I didn't know what to expect. Right. At the time, Bernard King was the only player coming back from an injury like that. So he was inspiration. He was motivation for me. And then I'm fortunate enough to make it back. And so the second time I do it, my mind said is, well, I've done it once. I can do it again. Right. And then the third time was, I know what to do. Right. And that was the game I was playing with myself. And it, and it worked. But also, once again, great doctors, great people around me, and just being fortunate and, and also a little bit stubborn because I didn't want to give it up. Right. And, and my passion, my love for the game continued to drive and push me and, and help me persevere. Yeah. Now, where were you born? I was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. 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 So you are a Southern boy. I was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you better claim the South. How long were you there before you moved out? And how did you end up at Kansas? My parents went from Mississippi. They met at Jackson State University. Okay. And uh, my father was a professional basketball player. And he played pro basketball. And one of the coaches he played for was Larry Brown. Mm -hmm. Larry Brown got the job at Kansas. And he was putting together his staff. Got you. Larry Brown hired my father when we were still living in North Carolina. And so I moved to Lawrence, Kansas, days before the start of my senior year of high school. And 
I fell in love with it. I got there. The community was so welcome. But that's and tough biting. now. Your senior year, I mean, to be plucked out of your whole, and then do your final year and graduate with people you don't know. And that's a lot for a, what, 17-year-old? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And it was, it was different. You yeah. know, so we're, we're driving out there and I'm picturing all different types of scenarios in my mind. Like, what's this new school going to be like? Right. What, what are my new teammates going to be like? You know, who am I going to hang out with? Where am I going to go? And once I got there, a guy by the name of Jeff Johnson took me under his wing. Great friend and just kind of the whole community. It was unique in the sense of. Because I knew they had a star coming. But, they were like, he's, that's the guy. That's the guy. But there was only one high school in the town. Are you serious? And so. Everybody in the town rallies around the high school right. and, and, and the university. And, and, and sports. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it was something that was very beneficial for me in terms of networking and getting out of my comfort zone to go and, oh, I've got to immerse myself into this new culture. Yeah. And I did it. I had great people around me. And it was, it was a wonderful experience to the point of I met my wife. At the University of Kansas? Yes, I did. And so every year professionally in my off season of four, 15 years of playing in the NBA, we would always go back to Lawrence, Kansas as our home. And really? so when I retired, we moved back. Well, we didn't move back. We already had a place. And our kids finished school in Lawrence, Kansas. And, uh, and you have a boy and a girl, right? Yes. Yeah. And they're tall. They're, yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. My daughter's almost six foot and my, my son's about six, one and a half, yeah. six, two. So, yeah. yes. So what was it like? to actually coach at the same place where you were the star athlete. I was very fortunate to work for a guy by the name of Bill Self, who's one of the best coaches out there. Okay. Outside of yourself. Yeah, outside of myself. <laughs> but the crazy connection for us was is Bill played at Oklahoma State University. So my freshman year was his senior year. So we competed gotcha. up against each other. And then once he graduated from Oklahoma State, he came to Kansas and he was on the staff with Coach Brown. And so we had a very long-term relationship. Got and when it. he got the job at Kansas, he offered me a position and I took it. I got a chance to learn from him. And from there, I've been able to go to Tulsa, to, to Wake Forest and have a lot of different great experiences. Yeah. And speaking of experiences, do you feel like you had a good experience, although you were here for a short time, but here as a Hawk? Because when I mention your name, people really gravitate towards you. They, they love Danny Manny. Do you feel like the, the fans treated you well? Yes, but it was a little bit different okay. because I was traded for an institution. I was traded for Dominique Wilkins. There's a statue of Dominique Wilkins outside of the Coliseum <laughs> right now. And so there are a lot of fans here in the city, in the state, that wanted Dominique to still be here. Sure. And so, you know, replacing someone that's a legend, was was challenging. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I had great teammates and we went on to have a pretty good season. We won the Central Division Championship and, you know, went on a little run in the playoffs. Obviously didn't win a championship, but it was it was a great time for me. It was a yeah. great time for me in the sense of getting out and experiencing the, the arts here, experiencing the different restaurants, right. being able to take our kids to, to the park down the street and walk around. So it was really good for us. Got you. So do you, I mean, even though I know you come back a, a, a few times a year, and I feel like you still have some, some influence here and some impact, um, but what do you think in terms of your future in Atlanta? Do you have any plans to, to come back or to do something else? Or? Um, you know, my plans right now to be involved in basketball. And unfortunately for that, you really can't do a lot of planning. Yeah. Because you, it's unknown. It's mm -hmm. unexpected. And so for me, I'm going to go where the game takes me yeah. and kind of make the best of where I'm at. So speaking of that, it's interesting. I know that you have a love for children and really impacting, you know, um, our youth. And part of that probably comes because you were so nurtured. I mean, you had great, you had a wonderful childhood, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And then you've been groomed by great people all throughout your life. So is it kind of a give back thing? Or why do you have such a heart for our youth? Uh, I have a heart for the youth because one, it's a give back thing, but, but two, it's also playing it forward. Yeah. Somebody took the time to help mentor me, to help nurture me, and I'm just playing it forward. And hopefully somebody that I'm playing it forward with will do the same thing. And that's how it's gotta be. Yeah. You know, it's gotta have some type of journey along that path where we're all helping each other out. 
because our time here is not as long as we like. And when it's up, it's up. It is. And what do you want to be remembered for? I want to be remembered for somebody that made life easier and helped people out. And so legacy is another thing. Okay, he's my favorite person, Danny Manning. He's taken the, he's got the trophy friends. Um, because legacy is something that we talk about, something that I talk about all of the time. And, you know, we're here to empower people, to empower people. And so when we leave, people have got to have something to say. They've got to say you stood for something. They've got to say you did something. And I feel like so many of us leave even sooner than what we think they should, you know, they should have left. And there's, there's nothing left. And especially now we're in this time where we should be playing for everybody else so that we're leaving something for everybody else to benefit from. I certainly agree with that. I mean, even with the COVID situation, yeah. I mean, we're, in, we're in different times. We're in a situation that we've never experienced before. And the only way that we're going to continue to move forward is to love each other, to care for each other, and to, to find a way to, to move past all the things that are ills in our society right now. we got a lot of ills that we're trying to navigate. Yeah. And yeah. the only way that we're going to be able to do that at some point in time is we all got to come together and have some type of vision to how we're going to move forward and how we're going to not let the things that have happened continue to happen. Yeah, right. And that's the thing, right? It's kind of big because I think we've, we've hit a space where um, we always knew a lot of these things existed, but we might have gotten kind of comfortable, right? And thinking that, okay, we're making headway, we're doing some things, it's all good. And then... You know, Ahmaud Arbery and, you know, Breonna Taylor and, you know, George Floyd. And we start seeing all these things. And then COVID. And then you're like, wait a minute, we're not okay. That's right. Yeah. And that slap in the face, it's kind of like right when you blew your knee out. Like, wait a minute, this isn't okay, right? You're, you're on a path mm -hmm. to what you think is greatness. Yes. And then, uh, you know, sometimes God is like, oh, no, you're not there yet. Yeah. I mean, for me, I go back to my days in LA and I had a chance. I was in LA with the Rodney King riots. I was there. I was, I was in, You've a, seen some of this I, was, I was in a part of LA with one of my friends out visiting. We were eating a meal and the verdict comes on the TV and it's not guilty. And I look at him and go, we got to go. <laughs> <laughs> we got to go. Yeah, this is about the, yes. yeah. And so by the time we got back to my house and we turned the TV on, it was, there was chaos. Wow. It was chaos. And so, I mean, but the energy with this movement is different. Why do you say, what do you feel like? I feel like there's more longstanding commitment to wanting to see change. Right. I mean, we hear the, we see you. We see you. We hear you. Okay, that's good. You've been seeing this and you've been hearing us right. now for the last month or so. Right. What type of changes are we going to make? What are some results? That's what we're looking for now. Right. I'd agree with you. It's got to change now because if it doesn't, like, I don't know where we go from here. Where we go is the direction that we're headed now. There will continue to be march. There'll be protests. There'll be a lot of uncomfortable conversations. But those uncomfortable conversations need to happen. Yeah. And once we understand that we have a, a better sense of empathy mm -hmm. for what each individual goes through in our country, the better off we'll be. I agree. I would absolutely agree with that. So speaking of change and transitioning, um, so you just finished up at Wake Forest. You were there for six years. Six years. Yeah. Tell us about that. It was a unique experience. You know, for me, I, I had a chance to be an assistant at Kansas where I went to school and I, I loved that. I got an opportunity to go to Tulsa and I was there for two years as a head coach. And then I got a chance to go to a Power Five conference yeah. school um, in the ACC, the conference I grew up watching because I grew up in Greensboro. And, and so for me, it was a one. Because you're a Southern boy. Yes, yes. You can be Southern by the, the time. South. I was born in the South. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, the ACC was the conference for me growing up. That's the one I wanted to watch. That's the one I could only watch because of the cable packages that we had. Yeah. And, and so for me, it was truly a lot of fun to be in that conference. And so it was a great experience for me. And now I'm looking for my next opportunity. So I hear that your next opportunity might be some on-camera work and you transitioning to, to be the, the face, right? On, you know, be on the other side of it now, right? You used to play the games, now yes. maybe you're calling the games. And um, what's led you there? And what's, your, what's the excitement we should build around that? 
for me, it's just the passion that I have for the game of basketball. Yeah. You know, I enjoy going into different venues that I've watched on, or see on TV or that I've heard about or my father played in. And the game of basketball has given me so much. And I, and I owe it so I owe the game. We all owe the game because it's putting us in situations financially right. that we could never imagine that we'd be in without that game, the basketball. Right. And, and so for me, I just want to enjoy this game. I want to enjoy the ride. I want to be a part of it because I, I love the energy. I love the passion. And I love to see growth in my young people. Right. And I love that, too. And, I, and it, it all comes out. You're, I think you have a, a quiet passion, right, that people can see just in your energy. Right. But I love when that passion gets heightened when something I mean, I bet you're you destroy it when, when it becomes an overt passion. But your love for the game, your love for kids, I think is a perfect marriage, one for you as a coach, but now being in front of the camera. Um, but I, I would love to follow you and see exactly what you do on this path of really reaching back, continue, continuing to establish, establish your legacy, which is kind of in a different way. Um, and to see where, you know, what the next chapter of Danny Manning looks like. Well, Michelle, thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. And I wish you the best of luck. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I, I wish you the best of luck, too. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thanks for tuning in. Of course, you can always catch me at 5 p.m. right here on the AIB Network. It's According to Michelle with Michelle Taylor Willis. You can follow me on socials on just about everything and make sure you look for Danny Manning because well actually you might not have to look too far because he's probably probably going to be coming somewhere uh, to a camera near you all right we'll see you next time